Hello, I'm Kath Price and welcome all of you to Owls and Small Mammals. There's something about owls. There's, it's something to do with the, the shape of the face. They've got sort of slightly human looking face with the owl's eyes facing forward and the sort of cuddly shape, big eyes and something very endearing about them. I know people who collect model ones, they love pictures of them, this sort of thing. But there's also the dark side of owls and as creatures of the night and they have scary screeches and this sort of thing. So there are sort of two sides of owls and I think people find them fascinating because of that. They have a reputation for wisdom um, you know, think about the uh, owl in Winnie the Pooh and these things. They're the, they're the sort of clever creature that people go to, the woodland creatures go to for advice. Um, in actual fact, it's uh, not quite true. They're really a bit thick. If you talk to people who keep them as uh, um, display birds, you know, the sort of hawk and owl people, sanctuary people and this sort of thing, um, they're pretty dense, really. Um, so I don't know how they got that one. And they're also so associated with the spirit world. Um, mainly, I think, because of their nocturnal habits. And also, um, things like church belfries make quite good uh, homes for them, particularly the, the barn owls like to live in inside buildings. And um, so you see them issuing out over the churchyard and things. And people thought they were connected with the other world. One of the um, North, North American um, First Nation tribes, the uh, one of the Pacific Coast, the West Coast Indians, Northwest Coast Indians, um, called the Kwakiutl, actually believed that an owl, if you heard it call your name, that was uh, a signal that you were to be taken to the other world before too long, and I mean they they. The owl was an emissary, if you like, from, from another world. Um, whichever way you look at them, they're fantastic looking things. They're tremendously photogenic um, and extremely interesting creatures. There's quite a lot about owls that is completely different from any other kind of bird. We have five species in the British Isles normal usual breeding species. Um, we've got the barn owl, that's him on the top left and uh, using this cunning little book I'm going to play you a barn owl sound. They actually make quite a variety of sounds, some of them are a lot more blood curdling than that one. Um, but yeah, this is sort of an eldritch screech it's described as in um, if you read gothic horror novels. Um, the tawny owl on the top right is the one that does the usual no noise you think of as an owl noise. <coughs> of course, that's the male owl. The female makes a, a, the sort of to it part of the call, it's a <coughs> sort of noise. Uh, so the to wit to woo is the female owl go followed by the male owl go hoo hoo. And at the bottom left is a little owl and they make quite another quite screechy sort of sound. There's a touch of a yelp about it. The little owl is a tiny little one. Um, and they're actually not a native, but they've been here so long, people tend to think of them as natives. Um, the final two, the long-eared owl at the top and the short-eared owl at the bottom. Long-eared owls are usually woodtime hunters. They're fairly um, unusual to see one. Um, the short-ears, on the other hand, hunt in open spaces. You can quite often see them on Whitsall Moss and they'll fly in the daytime, so they're an easy owl to spot. 
it's a really good time of the year to look for them. Um, at this time of year, the young owls are dispersing <coughs> from the territories they were born in, um, finding their own territories before the winter comes. Quite often you'll hear the, uh, particularly the tawny owls, calling on autumn evenings. Um, the younger ones tend to be not quite as good at it as the adults, so you can sometimes tell if it's a rather inexperienced bird calling or one that's been around a lot longer. Now, most of them eat small mammals, which is kind of why I like them so much, because they're very, very useful for collecting small mammal remains. And we'll come on to that a bit later, but this is one of the best owl sightings I ever had <coughs> was on um, Skoma in the islands off uh, southwest Wales. And I'd gone there particularly to look for Skoma voles. These are a subspecies of the, of the bank vole that live only on Skoma. So I was very excited to go and see them. And I went over to Skoma, a little boat across from the, the, the West, West, Southwest Wales Wildlife Trust have owned the place and they, they organised this boat to take them on a boat trip. So off, off I went um, and hunted for Skoma voles, which are quite active in the daytime. I didn't see a single one apart from one being carried by a short-eared owl. Um, this isn't actually the one, but it's a, it's a particularly good picture. You can see it's quite a big vole. It's a bigger vole than a, a, a bank vole, but my only view of it. Of course, when we were there, the, the owls were hunting for um, food for their young. They were hunting in the daytime, and you could see them really clearly. And this one flew towards my binoculars so really the view through the binoculars <coughs> was literally just the owl's face and eyes um i thought it was going to fly up my nose but uh, fortunately it swerved, swerved off before it got too close but absolutely fabulous things to see they're lovely quite different from our diurnal birds of prey these are a buzzard a kestrel and a sparrow hawk, again all predatorial, they all eat um, mammals or birds, uh, but the digestion and everything is really quite different. Um, we'll come on to that a bit more <coughs> later on talking about the pellets, but I mean the main difference is that the um, diurnal raptors have much stronger stomach acid so they digest more of the bones in their prey and they also tear their prey up rather than swallowing it whole. Most owls just swallow things um, in their entire package if you like. So you know, a, a small mammal just goes down all in one and isn't broken up. Consequently the bone remains in the pellets are very much more complete. So some unusual things about owls, um, because they're nocturnal, they have very good hearing and very good eyesight. Um, the tufts on the heads, of course, have nothing to do with their ears, despite the fact we call them ear tufts and long-eared owls and short-eared owls. They're just feathers and the owls use them to communicate. So they have sort of flattened feathers and upright feathers according to how they're feeling. And this is me pointing out exactly where an owl's ear is. Um, this is rather a, 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 a rather nice tame tawny owl at the Hilltop Birds of Prey Centre in the Ross on Wye. And I had a wonderful day there playing with all sorts of owls and hawks. Um, but their, their ears are sort of in the way you'd expect ears to be, in the side of the head. Um, this is a tawny owl skull and you can see the big opening behind the eye socket, where the, which is the ear opening. And here's a, a picture head on of it that shows you just how big those ear openings are. The other thing about them is, if you look at that, you can see that one is slightly higher than the other. Um, this is, makes it possible for owls to pinpoint their prey 
extremely accurately. Um, because they're slightly lopsided ears and the feathered disc or heart shape in the barn owl, but the, the, the disc around the eyes, if you like, directs the sound into the ears. Once they've locked on to their prey visually, they, well, they, they, they've, they've, they're looking straight at it. They can move the head slightly to just finesse where their prey is. So their hearing is extremely good. They also have very acute eyesight. Um, they're not blind in daylight like people used to think, but the eyes are adapted to gather maximum light. The more nocturnal the owl is, the darker its eyes. So as you can see, the top and middle, top, top left and middle, the barn owl and the tawny owl have very dark eyes. They're predominantly daytime hunters. Um, the eagle owl has sort of golden eyes. Um, eagle owls, because they're a more northerly species, will hunt in daytime or at night. Um, likewise, the short-eared owl with the yellow eyes, and the little owl has even paler yellow eyes and is predominantly a daytime hunter. Um, interestingly enough, the pygmy owl that lives in America has, is like a sort of small, thin version of a, of a, of a little owl. And they have really yellow eyes, and they're actually in the dark. They can't see any better than your eye. They're totally a daytime hunter. Um, but I mean, the idea of an owl that can't see in the dark is really quite interesting, I think. So for the scientifically minded, the structure of the eye, the top one here is an owl's eye. And as you can see, they have a massive cornea, the front part of the eye and um, they are, it allows a lot of light in so they can make use of every bit of light that's available if you think i mean you think they're out in the black dark then that's because of our eyesight there's very rarely nights that you really can't see anything outside it's never all that dark and um, owls are adapted to make the best use of it they also have um, rather rather than round eyeballs, they have elongated eyeballs. They don't see colour very well. They have mostly um, um, the, the receptors in their eye are designed for light rather than colour. They see movement rather than fine detail. But their eyesight is excellent. They're not totally reliant on the hearing. They, they use both. And once they've heard a small mammal, they'll able to see it as well. Um, because of the elongated eyes and the way they're set in the skull, they can't really move their eyes very much at all. So instead, they have to be able to turn their head. And an owl can turn its head through, through 270 degrees. So they can look back over their own shoulders. They can't turn it all the way around. If they did, they could just keep going and unscrew their head and it'd fall off. But um, they can turn it almost all the way in both directions. So that makes up for the fact they don't have very wide um, field of vision and they can't move their eyes very much. As you can see from the feathers, these are also adapted for their nighttime hunting. They're very soft feathers and this means the owl is quite silent in flight. They have, if you look at the edge of the feather in the picture, it looks almost as if it's frayed. But that's, so the edges are very soft and fluffy and there's no noise as it flies. Not so that the mice and the voles can hear it coming, but so it can hear the mice and the voles. Of course, if it's making a great racket flapping along, it's not going to be able to hear its prey. So that's why they have those wonderful soft feathers which gives them the lovely soft outline that they have. It's for silent flight. Another reason why they're thought a bit spooky, because you don't hear them, they just suddenly arrive.
Now, back to the interesting thing about owls, as far as I'm concerned, which is that they eat small mammals and they cast pellets so I can get the bones. Here is a picture of a, um, it's rather a fine picture, I think, of a barn owl casting a pellet. It's, it's a voluntary thing. They have to um, think about doing it. It's not just sort of automatic. Um, and they'll go into a sort of slightly meditative state and they'll sit on the perch and um, go a bit glazed and do a bit of hiccuping and hiccuping and then they'll throw up a pellet. Um, it takes maybe about eight hours since they've eaten the small mammal to, for it to be regurgitated in pellet form. And what happens is um, in the stomach they have this um, the, the, the digestive acid works on the, on the body of the creature it's swallowed and reduces it to sort of bowl soup with leftover fur and bones. And the, the action of the owl's stomach compacts the fur or feathers of its bird around the sharp bits, like the bones, <coughs> so that they won't scratch the owl's gullet as it's regurgitated. It's a very good way of disposing the bits you can't eat. And of course, as you know, if a bird poops on your windscreen, there's no solids in it. It's totally reduced to liquids, really. So there it is, disposing of the damp, the, the hard bits. Um, different owls cast different pellets. They tend to be different sized according to what they've eaten, according to the time of year and all this sort of thing. But this is a range of the pellets of all the different owls. Little owl pellets tend to be extremely fragile. They eat a lot of beetles and worms and things which don't have the hard bits and the fur and the feather. So if you find little owl pellets, they tend to crumble to dust in no time. But all the others will, will cast pellets with bone remains in them. Other birds ca uh, cast pellets too, of course. Anything really that eats stuff that can't pass through its stomach in the normal way will cast pellets. So the kestrels and sparrow hawks, um, because of the way they feed, they break the bones up quite a lot. They also pluck their prey. So the pellets won't have the same degree of bone in them and they won't have quite as much of the feather. They will swallow small feathers really just to make the pellet. Um, but proportion of bones in pellets really the, the owls pellets will be about 45-46% bone whereas in a, in a falcon's pellet you're down to about 7% something like that so much more bone in it and much more usable bone because it's all the bits are there uh, crows that have been eating small mammals Roughage of various sorts will cast pellets. Gulls will, with the fish bones in and things. Even kingfishers. But these small birds, the pellets are so very small, you can't really find them very often. So having got your owl pellet, <coughs> if you know an owl roost, you can usually pick some up. You can actually buy the things. I found some advertised on eBay yesterday. And for 15 owl pellets, they expected you to spend 58 pounds. And if the owls knew this, they'd all be making a fortune. Um, I have to admit, I've never bought one. <laughs> you can usually find one somewhere. If you know somebody who's got a barn with owls in, that's absolutely fa fabulous. The first lot I ever had to dissect was when I was starting to work on small mammal bones. And I was working in near Thetford. And there was a barn owl that nested in a hole in an oak tree. In the east of the country, they, the barn owls use trees much more for nesting than they do over here in the west. They much prefer buildings here. But this one had a, a nest, nesting hole in a tree. And um, a friend of mine, who was quite a lot taller than me, uh, said he'd get me some pellets out. And he went, he thought the owl was out, and, this, and he went and wrapped on the tree trunk. So you have to be very careful around owl nests. They can be very defensive and um, really quite unpleasant. 
this was out of the nesting season. This was in late August, so really we thought it was quite safe. And he went and tapped on the trunk of the tree, and this owl shot out over his head, about six inches above his head. Um, scaring everybody so, you know, if we all hit the ground really um, and uh, disappeared into the barn and we picked out some owl pellets and to be honest they were the best collection of owl pellets I've ever had in my life because they had everything in them they had field voles they had bank voles they had harvest mice they had field mice they had house mice uh, they had pygmy shrews and common shrews and the whole lot it had eaten a bit of everything so oh, water shrews even it was great it, I mean the whole the collection was like I say the best I've ever found um, I've had other ones they've had nothing in them apart from common shrews and field vaults or you know sort of two or three kinds of things but to get a collection of pellets with that many things in was just great and that really got me into the identifying small mammal bones which of course I ended up working on for quite a long time. So having got your pellet, you need to give it a bit of a soak. So put it in some warm water, maybe with a drop or two of Dettol or Milton or something like that to just disinfect it. If they're fresh, I always pop them in the freezer for a while um, just because uh, it kills off any insect life that's with them. Uh, you sometimes find little white maggots in them that are from um, sort of clothes moths and things. They feed on the on the feathers or the fur in the in the pellet, and it's somehow less horrible if you find one that's completely dead from being in the freezer rather than one that's sort of wriggling about and looking at you. So, having soaked it, you can then tease it apart with a pair of tweezers and carefully pick out the bones that are in it. And this is a sort of fairly um, standard of what you'd expect to find in a single owl pellet. This is, these are barn owl pellets. Um, as you see, a wide range of bits that, I mean, really you're not going to tell terribly well whether it's a bowl or a mouse. They're about the same size. Their ribs look very similar, this sort of thing. But if you've got the jaws, um, the mandibles, the head, the skulls and the jaws, you can... Uh, you can tell quite easily. So lots of things to uh, to look at there. And this one's a, just a bit of a close up. And you can see you've got the skull at the top there and you've got two mandibles, um, sort of bits of uh, vertebrae below and um, the, the, the thigh bone here at the bottom. So all very nicely parts of a um, parts of a vole. These are the fragments from a Merlin's pellet. This is our smallest falcon, and they feed mainly on pipits and larks and things like that. They tend to be a heathland species, and as you can see, there's very little bone from the pellet, and it's very fragmentary. There's nothing really you would recognise as being particularly belonging to any species you could identify from it. So here's some of the little furry people that the owls like to eat. Um, I always think it's much nicer to look at them with the fur on rather than the, uh, the skeleton remains, they're far more interesting. So field voles and bank voles obviously make the, the majority of the um, diet of, of, of most owls. They're, they're quite fat little bundles. They're, um, they're qu quite high calorie, really. Um, water voles are rather large for some of our owls and tend to be... Um, not quite so easy to catch. They will take young ones. Um, the famous Scoma vole up there on the left, obviously the short-eared owls in Scoma are living mainly on the Scoma voles. Short-eared owls are rather specialist vole feeders. Um, voles have a cyclic population, a bit like lemmings and things do, in that the population will expand and expand and expand, and then eventually there'll be so many of them it just crashes completely. And there are recorded incidences of vole plagues. Um, there was the famous vole plague of Estelmure of 1876 or sometime like that, 
can't remember exactly. And the area, first of all, was completely covered by um, field voles, um, huge boom of population of them, which was followed by the enormous expansion in the numbers of short-eared owls. And they were bringing up three broods a year of five chicks in each, and the place was absolutely full of short-eared owls. Then, of course, the population crashed, and the short-eared owl population followed it. They moved away from it, but many of them starved. There were just too many. But this is fairly typical of small mammal breeding dynamics. House mouse up here on the high, high, top right and a wood mouse down at the bottom there. These are all sizes of things and uh, pretty much any owl species could take, apart from the very smallest. Um, shrews, again, quite popular. Owls eat a lot more shrews than mammalian predators do. There's something in shrews that really doesn't taste very good. Um, owls don't really have much taste buds. So whereas your cat might kill a shrew but will leave the body, owls just gulp them down. Um, so we have a common shrew, water shrew and a pygmy shrew, which is a tiny little thing. A lot of owls, if they're feeding well on voles and mice, they really won't bother with something as small as a pygmy shrew. It's just too little to be worth the effort. But if, you, if you're pushed and you're hungry, anything will do. And then finally, the more uncommon ones, but you do find them in owl pellets, are dormice and harvest mice. Harvest mice, of course, again, a very tiny species, but sometimes they will, they will take them. Never been able to train an owl, which is a species that's nice to eat and common, whereas one like a dormouse or a water vole, perhaps, would be happier if they'd leave them alone, but really they don't, they don't, they don't recognise species, they just go, oh, dinner. And of course, when we've got nothing but the teeth left, we have to identify the remains from those teeth. So the patterns of the teeth will tell us who's who. Um, we've got a field vole at the top here. They have these rather zigzag teeth that look like old-fashioned radiators, if you see them from the side. Mice have teeth that have little bumps on them, and shrews have rather pointy, jaggy teeth, all to do with what the creature eats. Voles are grazers, so they need tough teeth for grinding up grass. Mice are more omnivorous, and shrews, of course, are insectivores, so they need the little pointed teeth for crunching up the little beetles and things. And these are the sometimes easier to see with the diagram. And you can see here that the, the vole teeth have slightly different patterns, so you can tell which one's which. And similarly, with the mice, they can also, you can also tell which one it is. And the root holes will tell you as well. So if the tooth has come out, you can tell from the, how many root holes there are exactly what species it is. You just need a good key. And there's a couple of good ones available. The Field Studies Council do a very nice laminated fold-out sheet, um, owl pellets and um, what's in them. And the Mammal Society also do a very nice little booklet about how to identify prey remains from owl pellets. Um, either of those would, um, if, if you're interested in doing something like this, either of those would tell you what you need to know. Um, uh, here we are, just some of the insectivore teeth. Moles and bats can also be taken by owls, um, less commonly, obviously, than shrews. But occasionally you get one that makes it a real speciality to hunt bats. Um, it seems to be a very individual thing. Um, moles tend only to be available when the young ones are dispersing, and that's the only time you'll find them overground. And they leave their parents, their mother's burrow, and they will travel overground to find somewhere to make their own. And that's when the owls get them. Um, fairly unusual thing to find, but uh, not impossible. Uh, this one is a bit more to do with vole teeth, 
they do grow continually through the eight through the lifespan of the of the animal. Um, this one is a bank foal. They're slightly different from the field foals. Field foals' teeth look like this, like the the one on the left there, through the life. Only the height of the tooth, if you like, the side of the tooth gets shorter and shorter. Bank foals actually grow roots, which will then push the tooth up through the gum, so there's always a surface to chew on. So that's why it ends up looking rather strangely long-legged at the end. It starts off with no visible roots, and as the animal gets older, it grows longer and longer. Of course, these things have quite short lifetimes, um, even if they don't get eaten by an owl. So you don't tend to get terribly aged voles showing their teeth like this. Dormice have quite interesting teeth. If you're lucky enough to get an owl pellet that's got a dormouse in it, um, absolutely fabulous thing to have. I I've, I've, I've have got a dormouse remains, but it was a roadkill dormouse. And as you can imagine, there's not really an awful lot left of a dormouse once it's been run over. Um, more like a dormouse frube than anything else. But I have, I've got its teeth are there, but they're not in its jaws and they're not particularly well done. Um, so these are just some of the more interesting and different bits of owl diet. Uh, the dormice have these wonderful teeth. They're seen side on, they look like a dining table. They've got a very, um, very shallow crown and quite long roots at the corners. So, you know, like I say, just like a dining table. And these, these ridges across the top, which are obviously um, a, a, a different way to have, adapt your tooth for eating nuts and um, leaves and fruits and things. Um, young rabbits, weasels will also appear in owl diets. Um, it's a shame, really, that we only occasionally have short, uh, eagle owls in this country because they can eat obviously much bigger things, and uh, you could get a wider range, if you like, of, of small mammal remains and slightly larger mammal remains if we had them. We did have eagle owls breeding in this country up in Yorkshire and one actually was found in Shropshire having flown unfortunately into some electric cables and killed itself. Um, so that's our last record of eagle owls in, in Shropshire. Um, the other exciting ones are snowy owls. You occasionally get on some of the Scottish islands, but they're very much an Arctic and tundra species. But uh, personally, I think we ought to have more eagle owls, and, and they'd be an absolute decoration to the avifauna of, of Britain. We used to have them. They used to be quite common in, in Britain. But of course, uh, in the way of all large predatorial things, they are no more. This just shows a... Um, pie chart showing what the the common um, prey remains for, for barn owls are. So um, mostly uh, field voles, uh, bank voles and field mice, and then a few other bits and pieces. Now, of course, my main interest in it really stemmed from my previous work, which was in, in archaeology. I was an environmental archaeologist, and I studied small mammal remains from cave earths. Um, this, is, this is one of the West, Westbury ones. Westbury wasn't, wasn't one that I worked on, but it's a particularly good example. And you can see, if you look carefully, in the cave earth, there was absolutely masses of small mammal bone. And the work involves picking out all these minuscule bits of bone, identifying each of them, and then um, working out percentages, what was there, what wasn't there, what was missing. And from that, you could work out the environment that was there at the time. Um, and then that would tell us what really was available as resources to uh, human hunters that were living there at the same time. So that was kind of why I got so excited about small mammals. The environment an owl lives in um, has a huge impact on what will be available for it to, to hunt for. So 
some kinds of countryside obviously are better than others. Uh, this is our reserve at um, Melvery Meadows in North Shropshire, near, near Whitchurch. And it's a great place for owls. There's tawny owls, uh, barn owls and short here, uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, little owls all hunting there. Um, it's a hay meadow, so it's usually long grass. It's absolutely full of small mammals. It's got fantastic hedgerows that are absolutely full of small mammals as well. And it just generally, because it's organically managed, the huge biodiversity and um, vast numbers of small mammals. So very popular place for the owl to hunt. Um, they like to hunt along the edges of things because that's where the highest number of small mammals can be found. So they'll go down the hedges, you'll see the barn owl going down the hedges, picking off all the voles and mice it can find. These sort of areas with long grass <coughs> very, very important for owls. The other thing that's nice for them is, is mature trees, hopefully with some holes in them to provide nesting sites. But farmland, like you see more of now, unfortunately, the, the more um, industrial farmland that's had a lot of herbicides and pesticides and it's been re-sown with the ryegrass there isn't the diversity there, it's not so attractive to the small mammals and consequently not so attractive for the owls. But this is our meadows at Melverley, which as you can see in the summertime, full of flowers, the grass is up to your knees, plenty of cover, plenty of small mammals around and these wonderful big oak trees with holes in them that serve as nesting places. But what are we going to learn? from messing about with all these owl pellets. We know exactly what the bird's been eating. It's very hard to tell what birds are eating. You can see what they're bringing back to the nest in the springtime, maybe. Um, nighttime hunters like owls, you know, most of the time you wouldn't know. So we know what it's eating. We know how it's hunting by the prey it's taken. We know what percentage of different mammals it's taking. So we know the probably the um, general the distribution of different species through the habitat. We find out a lot about the, the prey animals, how the food chains work, what part the owl plays in them. Owls, of course, are apex predators. They're not very much eats owls, the occasional hawk will, but generally speaking. Um, and a lot of information about what small mammals we have in an area, which adds to um, trapping programs, live trapping programs, to know what sort of populations we've got. The small mammals, of course, are, are, are very important for the survival of a lot of predators as well as owls, but the owls are showing us what's there. So from that, we can extrapolate what's available for the weasels and the stoats and the kestrels and all the other creatures. So the more you can do to help them, the better really. They're keeping a healthy ba balance in the population. Um, what would now need, I mean you're not going to put voles on your bird table, but safe nesting places is very important. Um, less and less decaying um, old trees standing in the landscape now. So there's less tree holes and a lot of more barns and old farm buildings being converted into desirable residences. Unfortunately, desirable for people, not for owls. So these places that they traditionally nested in, perhaps becoming less common. Um, they will use nest boxes. Um, these two here are designed for a barn owl on the left and a tawny owl on the right. Several, many designs available. These are from CJ Wildlife, um, available from our shop here at Shropshire Wildlife Trust, and you can go online and see what you can get. Um, generally speaking, with the barn owls, um, I've been told that you might have to put up two because you have the box that the nests in and the female and the chicks, and the male owl likes one that it can see the nest site from 
but is not actually with it, so it's a little, maybe a tree opposite it, so it can keep an eye out, but has its own place to go to in the daytime. So it's like a sort of, um, they're not quite single parent families, but you, they, 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 they like to stay apart in the daytime. So lots of different um, designs you can look at, maybe designs you can build your own, that sort of thing. And if you have a, a barn or a shed or something, you could perhaps put a box up inside it if there are barn owls around. Uh, Shropshire Barn Owl Group um, had a huge involvement in putting up barn owl boxes right across the county and great success in en encouraging more breeding barn owls um, around the county where the numbers had actually gone really disastrously low but they're now bouncing back. They're very weather dependent owls in general because um, they don't like to hunt in the wet, so they're not very waterproof things. Um, they can't, if it's raining, they can't hear their prey. So in a very bad spring, they might not breed at all. Uh, hard winter, um, with a lot of snow cover, they can starve quite easily. So obviously, the more we can do to help them find breeding spaces, and the more we can do to, to help the population increase when it's possible for it to do so, the better. But definitely worth encouraging them because really, what better site could you have than a, a barn owl or a, a, a tawny owl here swooping through your garden? Um, or a barn owl hunting in the fields opposite you? This is, we have one that flies through the meadows across the lane from our house. And I spend a lot of time standing on the landing watching it. And sometimes if I'm really lucky, it flies right under the window so I can get a sort of bird's eye view of that wonderful plumage on the back of it as it goes beneath the window and they're the most beautiful colour and it's the most wonderful thing to see. So everything you can do to encourage them, the better. And if you do nothing else, one of the things you can do to encourage them is join the Wildlife Trust. Shropshire Wildlife Trust has over 40 reserves in the county uh, they all provide fabulous places for owls to be. They're all full of wildlife, full of small mammals, full of owl food. We have standing dead trees and all sorts. Melsley, one of them, absolutely great for owls. Lots of the others all around the county um, doing equally good service. So join today, help us keep all these reserves going, especially in this time that we, we, you know, we're all in the pandemic and. Maybe we're not getting out as much. We haven't got the events that you can come to that we can we can collect money and you know, have a think about it and just your know, three pounds, five pounds a month will help us keep going. Um, hopefully we'll all get back to normal and we'll have proper outdoor events and uh, this will be like a bad dream. But in the interim, keep us going. Do. Thank you.